We'll be back with a little bit of space history in the making. We're continuing our newscast now with a little bit of space history in the making. American Dennis Tito is reaching for the stars today. He's aiming to be the first space tourist blasting off shortly from Kazakhstan on board a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The uh, lift should, be, uh, should go as previously planned. We'll have more on that update later. As we told you earlier, there is a little bit of space history in the making today as American Dennis Tito is reaching for the stars. He's aiming to be the first space tourist blasting off shortly from Kazakhstan on board a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The liftoff should go on as planned, but the American Space Agency says the Soyuz docking to the space station may be delayed if necessary due to computer glitch on board the space station. The deal announced by NASA late allowed the uh, Soyuz launch to go ahead as planned, but required it to remain at a safe distance from the station. If Endeavour had not departed when Soyuz arrives, the NASA wanted to keep the space shuttle Endeavour docked until mission control is in firm control once more. And said there was a danger of collision if Russian Soyuz module tried to dock before Endeavour was ready to leave. Now, Mr. Tito is, as I said, the first American to fly without NASA approval. And we're joined now by Denis Lef Lefkovich, who will talk us through the launch in Kazakhstan. Welcome to the program, Denis. Uh, how do you do? So uh, we're you really minutes away from the launch of the uh, Soyuz TM space rocket, which will take the crew of three cosmonauts, as they call them here, uh, to the, into the orbit. It's the really international effort here, as the International uh, Space Station is uh, put together and maintained by 16 nations altogether. The crew is com combined uh, of uh, American Tito, Russian Musabayev, and Kazakh Baturin. Now, now uh, we're about seven minutes from the launch. The rocket is set on the launch pad. It's been actually standing there for more than two days, going into the oh, through all kind of preparation procedures and everything. Um, as you mentioned, there might be a delay with docking. What happened is uh, two days ago, the computers in uh, American segment of the International Space Station have malfunctioned. Uh, luckily, the space shuttle Endeavour was docked to the space station, and uh, so its computers took a role of the command and control center uh, while the computers were fixed on board the actual ISS. Now, the problem with docking is that Americans say that approaching a module with three cosmonauts from Russia uh, can go too close, can come too close to the shuttle's tail and uh, Americans don't want to take a risk. The problem being discussed on a high level between American and Russian officials, and uh, the latest I've heard that uh, there wouldn't be any problems concerning the docking. But if glitches continues, Russians will have to stay in the orbit for some more time before Endeavour can undock from the station. Back to you, Timothy. Yes, Dennis, uh, what can you tell us about uh, Dennis Tito? How long has uh, he been preparing for this flight? Well, Dennis Tito, let me just give you some background of this man. He's an American businessman, a financier, actually, but he has some space-oriented background. He's actually been a rocket scientist with uh, NASA, a rocket engineer with NASA. He's 61 years old now. 
Um, he went through a very uh, strong training program, very long. It's more than a six-month long training program near Moscow. It, there's a special center to train cosmonauts. Right now, we see him actually with other cosmonauts sitting in the cockpit of the rock again, ready for the um, liftoff. Uh, he reportedly paid to Russian space agency uh, two, uh, 20 million U.S. dollars for this flight. And the history of that paycheck goes back to Mir Station because he actually had to go up on uh, Mir Space Station rather than uh, ISS. But Russians ditched their orbiter, the famous orbiter, and so the contract went on and his ticket, may we say, was rebooked uh, into this new uh, space station ISS. Dennis, uh, what, will, what will he do once he's up there in the space station? Uh, not much, really. Um, of course, he is not a professional. He went through a very long training process, but this training was mostly how to behave in extreme situations. If something goes wrong, every person on board the spacecraft has its pre-designed list of things he has to do in order to save himself and the crew. So that was the, the, the biggest part of the training. But actually, he'll participate in uh, two experiments uh, uh, involving uh, photography. And uh, one he's really looking forward to is uh, experiments with the stereo photography in space. Right now, we, if you, we're uh, seeing the rocket being uh, uh, prepared for the first stage of the launch. How much more time before the launch, Dennis? Uh, I have a feeling it's going to happen any second now. The, the Baikonur is a very huge space, very vast space, so actually we'll see the rocket taken off first, and only then we'll hear the, the rolling sound of engines. It's miles and miles to the rocket. You see the so engine how, is starting up right now. Okay. And it blasts off. The Soyuz TM rocket that you're seeing right now is uh, the most reliable space vehicle, the carrier uh, that ever existed. Very good uh, history. There were no crashes, crashes or anything so far, so we're all hoping that this flight will go well as well. So what, what we're seeing now, what happens next after this launch? Well, next step is, as we see, actually, uh, the initial uh, acceleration is not that, uh, not that strong, really. It's only about 4G. So uh, uh, cosmonauts in their specially designed spacesuits, they, um, they don't really experience now much trouble, unlike the early cosmonauts back in uh, 1961 when the first cosmonaut was launched in space. Uh, in some time, of course, we won't be able to see that, but the rocket's first stage will separate. And the history shows that if that's a separation of the first stage, uh, probably you see uh, right now. And if this stage goes well, the history sh uh, shows that um, the flight will uh, go without problems from then on. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis, for uh, taking us through the launch. And you've been watching a live launch of the Soyuz rocket in Kazakhstan, carrying the world's first space tourist, American Dennis Tito. It's bound for the International Space Station. We'll be back with more in about half an hour. Thanks for joining us. As usual, we'll have our experts on hand to answer some of your questions. You can also check out our forum at this address. So until next week, happy trading. Bye for now. Channel News Asia, a network of Mediacorp News. The program you've just watched is powered by Nissan Safiro.
Motown News Asia. The Philippine elections get underway in polls that may galvanize the fledging government or undermine it. Over in India, opposition parties win a landslide victory in state elections, seen as a public assessment of the Prime Minister's governing alliance. And Israel sets the stage for the most extensive missile strikes yet on the Gaza Strip. And those are the headlines. Good day, I'm Timothy Goh. You're watching Channel News Asia Today. Voting has begun in the Philippines amidst tight security. Some 100,000 police and soldiers have been deployed nationwide. And for good reason. Over 70 people have died in pre-election violence, making the campaign the bloodiest in recent history. Among the early voters, President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo and jailed former President Joseph Estrada. Estrada cast his vote from a military hospital where he is undergoing a medical checkup. His attorney said the former action film star was casting all his votes for opposition candidates, of course. A total of 13 Senate seats are up for grabs in congressional and local elections, as well as 262 seats in the House of Representatives. All eyes are on the battle for the Senate seats. Philippine newspaper Business World says President Arroyo's administration needs to secure at least seven seats to capture the majority in the Senate and be able to initiate important political and economic reforms. So the polls are widely seen as a crucial test of legitimacy for Mrs. Arroyo's three-month-old government. Mrs. Arroyo hopes to bolster support for her administration by winning control of the Senate after she took power when former President Joseph Estrada was swept aside by a people. Ipsos Reid survey released last week polled 8,500 adults in 16 countries and almost half said the potential for credit card fraud is their top concern. So despite all they do, e-businesses will still have to battle with this enduring problem. Now before we go, here is this week's question offering you another shot at winning a Canon Ixus 300 with a attachable printer. For your chance to win this, answer the following question. Who were the two brains behind 405 The Movie? Email your answer to this address and for more competition details, log on to East Asia. Infinite information. From 28 August, you'll have more reasons to tune in to Channel News Asia in the morning. Prime time morning. More from 7 to 8, Monday to Friday. Over 65 destinations from Singapore. Time by Qantas. Good evening, I'm Timothy Go. This is Asia Tonight, live from the Channel News Asia News Center in Singapore. And we lead off this hour in the Philippines. Officials there say they are preparing criminal charges in connection with the hotel fire that killed over 70 people. According to authorities, safety violations contributed to the deaths. Most of those who perished died from smoke inhalation. The owner of the hotel is likely to be charged with homicide. The three-hour fire ate through the middle floors of the hotel in suburban Quezon City on Saturday, transforming the six-story building into a death trap. At the Manor Hotel on Sunday, a mass was held to offer prayers to those who perished here in the country's deadliest hotel fire. Flames spread through the hotel on Saturday morning, killing over 70 people. So, these deadly bars contributed to the number of deaths. The grills were built to keep thieves out, but during the fire it kept desperate hotel guests locked in with no way to escape. Investigations so far have revealed the cause of the fire. 
we have established that the fire had been caused uh, by an electrical short circuit, and this is uh, corroborated by witnesses uh, in the area. Authorities say if the hotel had been properly equipped with fire alarms and had adequate escape routes, many more lives could have been saved. Questions are now being raised about the safety of other buildings in Manila, and some people are asking just how many more fire deaths like this have to take place before officials decide to act. Separatist rebels in the Indonesian province of Aceh say they cannot work with new President Megawati Sukarno Putri, and they've demanded foreign intervention to end the bloodshed in the troubled province. The Free Aceh Movement's deputy military commander told Reuters news agency in an interview that he did not trust the president. Meanwhile, a leading international rights group has accused both Indonesia security forces and Aceh rebels of mounting human rights abuses in the province. The Human Rights Watch said Jakarta had failed to control the military and police in Aceh, and it called on President Megawati to quickly set up human rights courts to prosecute serious violations. Rebels marked Indonesia's Independence Day with a bombing spree in Aceh. The blast began soon after President Megawati Sukarno Putri ruled out independence for the province but apologized for past abuses in a first state of the nation address. One of the toughest challenges yet is to quell the rebellion that has killed more than 1,500 people since January. On Sunday, a top official of the Free Aceh Movement said Mrs. Megawati's policies would only harm the people of Aceh. But he said the rebels would press ahead for a resumption of peace talks with Jakarta. Still, he demanded that international monitors be allowed to police any future ceasefire. Mrs. Megawati has firmly turned down an independence vote for Aceh, similar to that which saw East Timor reject Jakarta's rule in 1999. She aims to push ahead with the ousted predecessor Abdurrahman Wahid's policy to give Aceh more autonomy. But many in Aceh claim Jakarta has failed to deliver on such promises in the past. And they doubt if Mrs. Megawati has enough control over the Indonesian soldiers and police to make good on her pledge. Meanwhile, the Indonesian government says it is hopeful for a peaceful ballot in neighboring East Timor later this month. Jakarta's foreign minister told the Compass Daily Indonesia will send observers to the elections, which will begin on August 30th. The European Commission will also send a batch of observers. The United Nations Administrator in East Timor, Sergio Vieira de Melo, has also appealed for calm from leaders of parties competing in the election. Analysts say, despite fierce campaigning, the territory's largest political party, Fretilin, is expected to win over rival party, the Democratic Union of Timor. Fretilin spearheaded the territory's independence movement two years ago playing a pivotal role in resisting Indonesia's 24-year occupation, which ended in 1999 after the territory voted to break away in a UN-sponsored referendum, has ensured its strong popularity in the territory. At a mass rally on Saturday, the party's general secretary, Mari Al-Khatiri, said he's confident of a landslide victory in the historic ballot. But we, for sure, that we would like, we would like to have a consensual constitution. In, the, in, the, in, in some important uh, items, for sure, that we will defend our position. Is semi semi presidential system is a very important for us. A very strong executive. A very independent judicial system. But still, a very the consensual parliament. Even with the vast majority, the parliament will go ahead working with the, with the others, consulting the others. East Timor goes to the polls on August 30th to elect an 88-member assembly which will draft a constitution and steer the former Portuguese colony to full independence. The Constituent Assembly will be transformed into East Timor's first national parliament when the territory gains independence next year. East Timor's popular independence leader, Janana Gushmao, is widely expected to become the territory's first democratically elected leader in presidential elections later this year or early 2002. And now a key element of preparing East Timor for independence is developing its defense force. And hundreds of former guerrilla fighters are now going through their paces as the first recruits for the new East Timor Defense Force. Drawn mainly from the ranks of East Timor's old resistance army, 
Fali Tien is the recruits are being trained by Portuguese and Australian military advisors. Canberra had also offered 14 million US dollars to help build up the force. Most of these recruits have already spent years in the jungle fighting for independence from Indonesia who invaded the territory in 1975. So it's no wonder that their average age is a mature 42 with the oldest being 56 years of age. They may know how to kill and have their own style of discipline but these fighters now have to learn the formalities and rigours of a modern army. The five week course covers basic training such as navigation, weapons, safety and instruction in human rights. United Nations advisors are structuring the Defence Force as one that will be able to see off militia incursions from the border areas of West Timor where hundreds of pro-Jakarta militias are still based. Hundreds of East Timorese were killed and tens of thousands forced across the border by the militias in 1999 after East Timor voted for independence from Indonesia. Ultimately, the East Timor Defence Force will have 3,000 members evenly divided between regulars and reserves. Three leading South Korean media executives have been arrested on charges of tax evasion and embezzlement. They will be held in jail pending trial. Critics have, have linked the arrest with government attempts to muzzle the media with an army of tax in inspectors. Prosecutors had sought the arrest of five media bosses. The five owners and executives of South Korea's major news dailies were alleged to have cheated tax authorities of millions of US dollars, embezzling the company funds for personal use. Those arrested include Bang Sang-hun, president of the Chosan Ilbo, South Korea's largest daily. Cho Hee Jun, the former chairman of the Kukmin Ilbo, and Kim Byung Kwan, the former honorary chairman of the Dong Ah Ilbo. This follows the first ever citywide government investigation into the accounts of media organizations. Tax authorities have levied a record 390 million US dollars in fines against over 20 domestic media firms. Traditionally, media organizations in South Korea do not have to undergo tax audits. And this is the first year Seoul is investigating these accounts. Opposition and newspaper groups have accused the government of mounting a tax probe to muzzle the media ahead of next year's elections. But the government maintains the probe and subsequent criminal investigation are not related to the leading daily's criticism of President Kim Dae-jung's economic and foreign policies. And still to come, hundreds fall ill and one person dies of food poisoning in the Indian state of Assam. The details when Asia Tonight returns. Good health starts with good habits. So take brands every day. Trust brands to keep you at your peak. More mm -hmm. oh, good health starts with good habits. So take brands every day. Trust brands to keep you at your peak. Brands for mind, for body, for life. Take HBM Vitalin from USA for vitality to keep you strong and healthy. HBM Vitalin contains 24 important vitamins and minerals. HBM Vitalin effectively enhances your health. The Singapore Prime Minister, Mr. Goh Chok Tong, will be delivering his 11th National Day Rally speech at the University Cultural Centre tonight. Channel News Asia will telecast live the Prime Minister's National Day Rally speech at 8.30pm. You can also log on for the rally speech at our Channel News Asia website at the following address. It's time to trade. Meet your market watchers. And more regional news now here on Asia Tonight. One person has died and six others have fallen ill after consuming contaminated grams or chickpea in India's eastern state of Assam. 
The state government has banned the sale of the seeds after they were found to have been laced with insecticide. Police have arrested some local traders and the Seed Corporation of India has come under fire. It has been asked to explain how the contaminated gram found its way to the market. It was not a very happy Independence Day for these people. The state police suspect they had eaten food distributed by a local student group on that day. And the food apparently contained some chemical treated gram seeds sold in the market. Not long after, they started having high fever and vomiting. Authorities are now investigating. We, we have ordered a collection of samples from all the districts and send it to the laboratory, state laboratory, for examination. And until the tests are complete, the ban imposed on Friday will remain in place. In all, more than 600 people were affected. Most who fell ill are said to be in stable condition, and this was the second case of food poisoning in Assam in the past week. Last Friday, about 500 people, a majority of them women and children, fell ill after they ate insecticide-laced food distributed at a government-sponsored peace rally. In Bangladesh, angry students at Dhaka University have held a march to protest the killing of a student activist. 22-year-old Feroz Ahmed was a member of the Bangladesh Chhatra League, the student wing of former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's Awami League party. Unidentified assailants had shot him to death in a dormitory on Friday. Hundreds took to the streets of Dhaka on Saturday to mourn the death of Ahmed. They also protested against a rival student group, which they accuse of masterminding the killing. Our friend Firuz Ahmed is killed by the rival group of our party. Today we are observing the morning day and it's a conspiracy to close all the education institutes of Bangladesh. Police have been deployed to handle any incidents of violence. Meanwhile, classes at the university have been suspended since Friday due to the unrest after the killing. An investigation has been launched into Ahmed's death. Over the past month, violence has erupted in many parts of the country. Just last Friday, two other political activists from the Awami League of former Prime Minister Hasina were killed by assailants. The Awami League and the Bangladesh Nationalist Party blame each other for the violence. The two are main rivals for the elections in October. China has sentenced 45 Falun Gong practitioners to up to 13 years in prison. The lengthy jail terms were handed down in nine separate cases. The Beijing Daily reported that the 45 were sentenced for organizing protests, making banners and printing leaflets in defiance of a government campaign against the movement. The newspaper labeled the practitioners hardened followers of the movement which has been banned in China since 1999. China has labeled the group an evil cult. Now, over in Washington, D.C., eight Falun Gong followers are on a hunger strike in front of the Chinese embassy. They are appealing for the release of Falun Gong members detained in China's northeastern province of Liaoning. The 130 detainees are believed to have started their hunger strike three weeks ago. The Chinese authorities have not made any official comment on their protests. In other news, the Philippines Justice Department is asking the Supreme Court to reconsider its decision to uphold a rule that bans television cameras inside the courtroom. The appeal is aimed at reversing the high court's ruling banning live coverage of the trial of former Philippine President Joseph Estrada. Our Philippine Bureau Chief Twink Makaraig reports from Manila. By an 8-6 to six vote, the Philippine Supreme Court rejected a petition from the Justice Department for live coverage of the trial of former President Joseph Estrada. The majority opinion was based on a 1965 U.S. case that, in sum, says that television coverage may compromise the defendant's right to due process. But now that the Justice Department has filed a motion for reconsideration, the debate continues. Melinda de Jesus spearheads the clamor for live coverage to support press freedom. She says the High Court didn't consider technological advancements since 1965 in its ruling, and neither did it differentiate between U.S. jury trials and trials in the Philippines wherein a trained judge makes the verdict. There is no threat to national security. There is no threat to the public figures that are involved. There are no witnesses that are minors. Uh, there are no victims of violence. There is no juror or jury who's 
lack of training in the legal questions would probably be influenced by having a camera over there. Last year's impeachment proceedings against Mr. Estrada was the closest the Philippines ever came to broadcasting a trial. While it didn't qualify as a criminal trial, there's little doubt that coverage forced its huge audience to re-examine their expectations of elected officials. That's a cause, some analysts say, that transcends debates between individual rights and the public's right to know. I think the effect on the whole judicial process is to make it more honest because people are watching. Uh, the whole basis of the democratic system is to remind everyone that people will find out and that it's not possible to hide things. But Mr. Estrada's lawyers say live trial coverage would be discriminatory. Why must there be a special rule as against one family? If you are saying that that's the only way to have justice here, then televise every trial. The former president's lawyers also argued that trial participants, even the judge, may play up to TV viewers to their client's detriment. The trial period may be lengthened by two to three times. That is a real possibility. Mm -hmm. The grandstanding will be there. You may ponder to the hooting throng. And uh, so on balance, uh, it really proves maybe the, the sounder rule is to be on the conservative side. Mr. Estrada himself says he has no objections to cameras in the court, but while Mr. Sagisa concedes that live trial coverage could also benefit his client, he feels national interest isn't necessarily served by broadcasting the trial. Please remember, it will take place during working hours in the daytime. And in this country where you have the largest numbers of texters, without work, or even those who work have no work ethic. I can just imagine the effect uh, on the populace. Not too many people will be working. The trial of Mr. Estrada isn't due to begin for some time, which means that it's less urgent, but no less important, for the High Court to take up the question of live coverage again. And as a close vote in the first ruling suggests, the High Court may very well find another way to balance two rights against each other. Quick Makareig, Channel News Asia, Manila, Philippines. In Amnesty International, the human rights watchdog has named a new chief. 44-year-old Bangladeshi Irene Zubaida Khan is the first Asian and the first female to head the organization. An expert in international law and human rights law, she has worked at the United Nations High Commission for Refugees for more than two decades. In 1995, she was appointed chief of the mission at the UNHCR's India Bureau, where she was responsible for the protection of 200,000 refugees. And China gears up for the biggest sporting event in its history. It's not the Olympics, but it's still a crucial test for Beijing. More of that story on Asia. Good health starts with good habits. Take brands every day. Trust brands to keep you at your peak. Mm -hmm. More oh, good health starts with good habits. So take brands every day. Trust brands to keep you at your peak. Brands for mind, for body, for life. Take HBM Vitalin from USA for vitality to keep you strong and healthy. HBM Vitalin contains 24 important vitamins and minerals. HBM Vitalin effectively enhances your health. In Money Mind this week, going for IPOs in spite of the poor market sentiment. There's no right or wrong time huh? as long as there is sufficient good demand. And a look at the investment potential of property in Malaysia. Join me, Joanne Lee, on Money Mind and be richer from it. Tonight, 8 p.m. This program is powered by Infinity Q45. And time for sports now, and we begin with this uh, with the sporting update with golf. Little-known American David Toms finished tops of the leaderboard in the third round of the PGA Championship. He leads Phil Mickerson by two strokes after a day of extraordinary shot making, 
at the Atlanta Athletic Club. 34-year-old David Toms was trailing Phil Mickelson by two shots with only four holes to go when he holed one of the longest hole-in-ones in major history. Toms polished off the par 3 15th to put himself 13 under. He went on to finish the day two shots ahead when he birdied the treacherous 18th hole. It was a miraculous performance for a player who thrice failed to make the cut in his last four PGA appearances. With eight birdies on his card, Phil Mickelson should have been on top of the leaderboard. He started the round well with this excellent second shot on the first hole. But he must have been feeling a little deja vu when he found himself going into Sunday's final round chasing Toms, the player who snatched victory from him earlier in New Orleans. World number one and two-time defending champion Tiger Woods lost none of his charm when he electrified fans at the ninth hole with an eagle from the fairway. But he finished 13 shots behind Tom's at one under 209. Japan's Shingo Katayama was arguably the luckiest player in the third round with this incredible shot on the 18th. That carded him a 69 for a total of 10 under 200. David, David Duval is in fourth place, five strokes off the pace with a three under par, 67 for 201. Liverpool began their English Premier League season with a continuation of their winning streak. A clinical double strike by England striker Michael Owens fired the Reds to an opening day victory over West Ham at Anfield. Liverpool had the majority of the early possession. Owen, who had been in devastating form pre-season, put Liverpool one nil up in the 18th minute thanks to Gary McAllister's clever back heel. West Ham threatened to cause an upset 10 minutes later. The Hammond Bulgarian striker Svetoslav Todorov was brought down from behind by Jamie Carragher. West Ham skipper Paolo Di Canio then chipped in and equalizer. That goal was West Ham's best. Todorov failed to get a lead for his team. In the second half, Liverpool dominated the game easily, but failed to achieve a breakthrough early. But minutes from time, Owen produced another piece of individual brilliance to wrap up the game Liverpool 2, West Ham 1. In tennis, Americans Jennifer Capriati and Serena Williams advanced to a final showdown at the $1.2 million WTA Tour Tournament in Toronto. Serena Williams vanquished Monica Seles 7-5, 7-6 avenging a quarter-final loss to Celis in Los Angeles. Capriati faced German Anke Huber in her semi-finals. After taking the first set, she came under threat in the second. But Capriati regained momentum to take down Huber 6-3, 3-6, 6-3. The Australian and French Open champion advances to her seventh final of the year, which will also be sort of a homecoming for her. It was here that the American won the Canadian WTA a decade ago at the age of 15. China is gearing up for its biggest sporting event this year, with Beijing hosting the World University Games from Wednesday. And then, stakes are high not just for the athletes. The games are being seen as a dry run of China's ability to stage the 2008 Olympic Games. The 2008 Summer Olympics may be seven years away, but in a few days' time, Beijing faces an early test of its organizational mettle when it plays host to the 21st World University Games. More than 7,000 athletes and officials from 160 countries will be converging on the Chinese capital. And Beijing is anxious to prove to its critics that it's capable of staging a successful international sports event. Beijing has spent about 200 million U.S. dollars on building and upgrading sports facilities as well as creating the athlete's village. And the president of the International Olympic Committee will also be in Beijing next week for briefings on preparations for the 2008 Olympics. The student games could bring criticism of Beijing's air pollution, creaking infrastructure and notorious traffic congestion. 
and China's human rights record could be in the spotlight again. Critics say that's why Beijing has thrown a massive security blanket over the city to prevent pro-democracy activists or Falun Gong members from disrupting the university games. In just a few days, the world will know whether China is on course to host the 2008 Olympics. And this is it for the Sunday edition of Asia Tonight. I'm Timothy Goh. Thanks for watching. Channel News Asia, a network of Mediacorp News. With the most number of roaming partners worldwide, Singtel Mobile is everywhere you are. home. For all the local stories, join me, Sharon Tong, on Singapore Tonight. 10 p.m. Mondays to Fridays on Channel News Asia. The Nanyang Technological University is seeking to break the stereotypical mold of passive Singaporean students. To nurture the visionaries of tomorrow's economies, NTU is encouraging students to think out of the box with competitions, technopreneurship courses and a $10 million Nanyang Technopreneurship Center. The university also wants to grow in the realm of life sciences by setting up a $465 million College of Life Sciences. At the present moment, our top priority is to establish our credential uh, in, in the area of biological sciences first. And then after that, we see uh, whether there will be still interest in developing a medical school. Although the first batch of students may only enroll in 2002, there are high hopes of training a new breed of doctors and engineers for Singapore's bioeconomy. Brought to you by Kodak Singapore, Style Photo Studio, Compact, Microsoft, Cisco Systems, INI Graphics Net, Sun Microsystems, Popular, and Sony. View your world. Channel News Asia. Good evening at 7.30 in Singapore. Let's have a quick look at the top stories out of Singapore this Sunday. Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party's General Secretary, or Secretary General that is, Taku Yamasaki, called on Deputy Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong this afternoon. His visit is part of a fence-mending trip to several Asian countries after Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi's controversial visit to a Tokyo war shrine earlier this week. Besides exchanging views on development in East Asia, Brigadier General Lee expressed hope that Japan would come to terms with its war past the way Germany has. Now, during their meeting, General Lee and uh, General Lee said Mr. Koizumi's statement on the 13th of August was a helpful official acknowledgement that Japan had committed a war of aggression in the Second World War and that it felt a deep regret for it. But General Lee noted that Japan as a country has not succeeded in putting behind it the overall question of its role during the Second World War. A fire scare at a vacant hotel at 165 Kitchener Road on Saturday morning. A switch in the switch room, which is located at the ground floor, had caught fire. 
The civil defense put out the fire in a few minutes. The fire did not cause any other damage except for a blackened ceiling. The cause of the fire is still being investigated. Well, basketball is a game that transcends the boundaries of disability, as some wheelchair-bound athletes aptly demonstrated. 45-year-old Edwin Koo, seen here, was struck with polio since childhood. He is taking part in the Singapore Sports Council for the disabled inaugural three-on-three -three basketball tournament. The council hopes to identify at least 10 potential athletes to be trained for an international tournament to be held in Korea next year. With 20 years of experience and many international competitions, Mr. Ku says it's the camaraderie that's got him started. Agreeing with him is Eric Lau. You can also log on to our website, which is mpvasia.com, right? Good luck with that. Remember to include your phone number so that we can get in touch with you when you win. All right. Now that's all the time we have for you this week. Uh, join us again next week as we dish out the dirt on Heartbreakers, which stars Sigourney Weaver and Jennifer Love Hewitt. Uh, and they play for two years and witness the shocking results for patients mutilated by phony plastic surgeons Somebody CSI is brought to you by Samsung Electronics